Homeowners and contractors select pre-finished wood floors because they don't require sanding, staining, or finishing at the job site. But while these products save time and effort, the proper use and installation of pre-finished wood floors is critical to customer satisfaction. When we use the right product for the job and install it correctly, we head off potential problems and ensure the beauty of our customers' floors for years to come. This program points out the differences between pre-finished solid, engineered, and floating wood floors. It explains where each type of floor can be used and the acceptable job site conditions for installation. Finally, it covers the specific installation procedures for glue down, nail down, and floating floor applications. Throughout this program, we'll emphasize the importance of keeping the work area clean, using tools properly, and completing each step in the correct sequence. Taking shortcuts threatens the integrity of the floor. This can result in cupping, creaking, and callbacks to the job from dissatisfied customers. And remember, the job's not finished until you're proud of the finished job. Understand from the beginning, wood is a living organism that continues to react to its environment even after it's manufactured into a finished floor. Too much moisture from the air or the ground causes wood to expand, while too little moisture causes it to contract. In solid floor installations, even small changes to each board can add up to big problems. Under poor conditions, a solid wood floor can expand or contract up to 3 inches over 10 feet. For this reason, the moisture content of the flooring, subfloor, and job site must be carefully controlled. Pre-finished solid wood floors come in a variety of colors, styles, and widths. Individual tongue and groove boards may be 5 sixteenths, 3 eighths, 1 half, or 3 quarter inches thick. Because solid 3 quarter inch wood floors are greatly affected by moisture, they must be installed on or above grade. Also, solid wood floors must be installed over a plywood, wood, or OSB subfloor and should be nailed or stapled. Some manufacturers suggest using glue in addition to nails or staples. Always follow the manufacturer's instructions. Pre-finished engineered wood flooring is a manufactured product made up of many thin layers laminated together in opposite directions. The top layer gives the floor its finished look. Because of the layers, engineered floors expand and contract in all directions, making them more dimensionally stable than solid wood floors. This allows them to be used on all grade levels and over most subfloors, including concrete. Engineered floors can be nailed, stapled, or glued down. If in doubt, follow the manufacturer's recommended installation procedures. Pre-finished floating wood floors are engineered floors manufactured into panels with tongue and groove along all four sides. With cross-grain construction and plenty of room for expansion and contraction, Floating wood floors can be installed at all grade levels and over practically any flat subfloor, including concrete. To install the floor, glue the panels together, letting the finished floor float freely above the subfloor. The first step in any installation is to review the plans and the materials required for the job. Minimum material requirements for standard installations equal the actual square footage of the installed area plus a 5% cutting allowance. Some questions you may want to resolve before traveling to the job site include, will you have access to the premises for the duration of the job? Are there restrictions on your working hours? Is the right kind of power available for your equipment? Have others with access to the job been notified of the work in progress? On remodel work or work in a home where people are living, you may want to ask, have arrangements been made to move furniture or appliances and disconnect water or gas? Does the existing floor contain asbestos? Will doors and thresholds need to be modified 
and who will do the modifications. Do baseboards need to be removed or shoe moldings added? And have arrangements been made for pets? Hi, I'm Steve Sebald, Director of Technical Training for the National Wood Flooring Association. Since wood floor installation should be one of the last things done on any construction project, about a week before installation we like to do a pre-site inspection. One of the first things to look for is to make sure all doors and windows are in place. This doesn't mean covered by 6 mil plastic. While we're out here, we also want to inspect the yard to make sure that all water drainage is going away from the foundation. Now we'll head inside. Once we're in the home, we want to check and make sure that all the wet trades are done. This means your masonry work, ceramic, all your sheetrock is done, all your painting is done. Remember, five gallons of paint is five gallons of moisture going into the air, so the only thing left unpainted should be your base mold. Where building codes allow, the HVAC system should be up and running. If not, temporary systems must be used to maintain temperature and humidity at normal living conditions. In cold weather, maintain a minimum temperature of 60 degrees for at least five days. In warm weather, run the air conditioner or make sure the home is well ventilated. When using temporary systems, be careful. Electric heat is very dry and can shrink wood flooring. Kerosene heaters leave an oily residue that can interfere with glue. And propane heaters add moisture, which can cause wood to swell. Before delivering flooring to the job site, check the moisture content of the subfloor. For plywood or wood subfloors, use a handheld moisture meter. Following the manufacturer's directions, test at several locations across the floor and average your readings together. In most regions, the moisture content of the subfloor should average 10 to 14 percent. To check for moisture in your concrete slab, you must wait a minimum of 30 days. We recommend 60. You may use a moisture meter, or you can do what we've done here, which is tape 6 mil plastic to your concrete, seal it all the way around with duct tape, wait 48 hours, come back if there's no sign of condensation, you're good to go. If moisture is present, run a calcium chloride test to determine the moisture content and take remedial action before proceeding. When the job site is stable and dry, store the flooring where it will be installed and acclimated according to manufacturer's recommendations. Before you install a wood floor, make sure that the subfloor is structurally sound. Check the subfloor for stability and flatness. If you find plywood that is structurally weak, it must be replaced. Also, test for squeaks and creaks, and nail or screw down any you find. On plywood subfloors installed over joists, check the thickness of the wood. Floor joists on 19-inch centers require 3 quarter inch plywood or OSB. Joists on 16-inch centers require a minimum of 5 eighths inch plywood or OSB. It is not the installer's job to correct major construction flaws. Take your six-foot straight edge and lay it across any dips or rises. If the gap is more than one-eighth of an inch, correct the situation. Float shingles or felt over low spots to quickly fix small dips. You can also use an approved leveling compound, but it must dry completely before continuing. Leave the proper expansion space at all walls. This may require removing baseboards, adding shoe moldings, or undercutting existing baseboards. Also, check the plywood seams. If they're high, sand them flat with a sander or edger. After the subfloor is structurally sound, sand off all drywall mud, paint, sealer, and other imperfections. Then carefully sweep or vacuum to remove dust, dirt, and debris. For lightweight concrete, you may need to install a plywood subfloor. Draw a nail across the surface. If it leaves no indentation, the slab is not lightweight concrete. Also, use a six-foot straight edge to check for dips and rises, as you did with the plywood subfloor. Concrete slabs or basement floors must be properly constructed. Discuss major problems with the contractor or homeowner. Fill in low spots with the manufacturer's recommended leveling compound. Use your trowel to apply a smooth, even coat and check your work with your straight edge. For a high spot, 
Grind it flat using 20 grit paper, grinding stone, or specialty hard plates. Trim the door jams so that wood flooring will fit underneath. Clean off all dirt, paint, drywall mud, and so on. If needed, use a floor buffer with 20 to 36 grit sandpaper to get the floor clean. Then carefully sweep or vacuum to remove dirt, dust, and debris. Pre-finished engineered flooring may be installed over a plywood subfloor or concrete. Over plywood, it may be glued down, stapled, or nailed. For this demonstration, we'll install the floor over concrete using a glue-down application. Starting methods and installation procedures may vary. If in doubt, refer to the manufacturer's instructions. Decide in advance how you will work and where you will stage your materials and tools. Don't forget, you're installing a pre-finished floor. Nicks, scratches, or damage to the finish may require extensive repair, so use caution. Wipe your feet carefully before entering the home. Dirt and debris tracked in from outside or the garage can damage the finish and threaten a quality installation. To begin, measure the width of the room from both corners. If one side is longer, Divide the difference by two and add it to the longer side when determining your starting points. A measurement on this end of the room is 140 inches. And on this end of the room we have 141 inches. The difference is an inch, so we'll split that in half, which is a half inch. We'll add that to our chalk line measurement on this end. Now measure out three inches from the corner and snap your line. Remember to adjust accordingly if you found a variance. Secure a backer board to the new line to hold the first row of boards in place as you push against them. Leaving enough workspace, rack out approximately three feet of floor, making sure to stagger the ends in a random pattern. As a rule, stagger end joints a minimum of six inches between pieces on adjacent rows and avoid lining up the joints. After we have racked out some flooring, we lay down some of the manufacturer's recommended adhesive using the recommended trowel. Whenever troweling the glue, you want to hold the trowel at a 45 degree angle, giving good even pressure. You want to get good coverage, good lines. Install the first row with the edge of the tongue against the backer board. Carefully align the board and seat it into position. For adjoining rows, avoid sliding the board through the adhesive. Instead, place the tongue into the groove as close as possible to the final position and adjust as needed. If you get any glue on the floor, wipe it up immediately before it dries. Use the manufacturer's recommended cleaner. If it dries, it's harder to get off later and you might ruin the finish. Complete the installation using the same procedures. If you need to work on the newly installed floor, use a kneeling board to spread the weight. When the glue is dry, pull up the backer board and finish the installation. Wipe off the adhesive residue with the appropriate cleaner as you go. It's no longer necessary to use a floor roller unless specifically recommended by the manufacturer. Pre-finished solid flooring must be installed on or above grade. Over concrete, you must test for moisture, use a proper vapor retarder, and install a plywood, wood, or OSB subfloor. Engineered floors may also be stapled or nailed to a proper wood subfloor. Never fasten solid wood 3 quarter inch tongue and groove flooring with glue only, and never nail it directly to concrete. When working over concrete, Begin by installing the vapor retarder. Roll out 6 to 8 mil polyfilm over the entire slab. Extend the film over the wall and overlap the seams at least 18 inches. For extra protection, you can also join the seams with duct tape. Now cover the polyfilm with 15 pound asphalt roofing paper. 
Vapor retarder requirements vary according to product, manufacturer, and moisture conditions. Once again, follow the manufacturer's recommended procedures. Three types of subfloors include the screed system, the plywood or OSB fastened subfloor, and the plywood floating subfloor. When job site conditions allow and subfloor height is not a concern, a floating subfloor is a very good system because it allows you to span the dips and valleys in a concrete slab. To begin, loose lay 4 by 8 sheets of half inch or 3 eighths inch plywood over the vapor barrier. Although plywood must be at least CDX grade, you can use a better grade for a flatter, easier installation. Stagger the joints by cutting the first sheet of every other run in half. Leave one quarter inch gapping between the sheets and at least a three quarter inch expansion space at walls, posts, and doorways. Now, loose lay a second layer over the first at a 45 degree angle. Fasten the two layers together using three quarter inch staples, nails, or screws to avoid puncturing the vapor barrier. Staple the floor every six inches in both directions. For a screed system, which is a grid work of 2x3 or 2x4 inch boards, use Group 1 density pressure treated kiln dried lumber in 18 to 48 inch lengths. Apply the boards with cold bond mastic or an approved adhesive. Lay the screeds on 12 inch setters at right angles to the direction of the finished floor. Offset end joints 3 to 4 inches and leave a 3 quarter inch expansion space. Set screeds in rivers of adhesive. Lay 6 to 8 mil polyfilm over the screeds and use an approved underlayment over the screeds if required. For a fastened plywood or OSB subfloor, use 3 quarter inch CDX or better grade plywood or a minimum of 5 eighths inch CDX grade plywood. Stagger the joints and leave a quarter inch gap between the sheets and a three quarter inch expansion space. And fasten the sheets every 12 inches on the border and at least every 12 inches at the center of each four by eight sheet. For this demonstration, we'll install a pre-finished three-quarter inch solid wood floor over a plywood subfloor. The moisture content of the subfloor must be within 2% of the flooring for solid plank and 4% for strip floors. When working with pre-finished floors, always take care to protect the finish. Prepare all tools and cutting surfaces away from the job and cover all surfaces and edges with duct tape to avoid scratching the finish. Begin your nail down installation by covering the wood subfloor with 15 pound asphalt felt building paper. This helps keep out dust, retards moisture, and helps prevent squeaks as the floor ages. Overlap the seams two to four inches. Next, measure each wall to find the center. Then snap a primary chalk line parallel to your working direction. Double check your measurements. Now secure the backer board to the center line to hold your first row in place. Leaving about six inches of working space, lay out the boards end to end in a staggered pattern across the room. Start the first run with the groove side facing the backer board. Offset end joints at least six inches between adjacent rows and avoid H patterns. When racking your room out, you want to be sure the boards that are at the end you either want to have enough room left over on the board to use it on your other end as a starter board or you want it to be a small enough piece one or two inches where it's not a lot of waste if you're overlapping four or five inches every time that can accumulate to a lot of waste um, when you mark your boards you want to turn around opposite of the way you were racking it would be tongue to tongue butt it tight against the wall come a quarter inch off the top of the board mark it Blind nailers and staplers come in a variety of sizes. Be sure to use the right nailer or stapler for the job. Also, different manufacturers often recommend different fasteners. Once again, refer to the manufacturer's installation instructions. To fasten the floor, pull the first board to the backer board, position it, and blind nail it using your nailer or stapler. 
the machine automatically positions the nail at the proper angle and countersinks the head. Never surface nail in the center of the room. When installing solid flooring over plywood on a concrete substrate, make sure the fastener length you use will not penetrate the vapor barrier. Fasten at the manufacturer's recommended schedule. Avoid driving fasteners into seams or joints in the subfloor. When you reach a wall where the machine won't fit, blind nail the boards by hand and countersink the heads. Pry the last row back to tighten the boards. Leave a three-quarter inch expansion space. Then drill and surface nail the boards to secure them. Now pull up your backer board and reverse direction using slip tongue. Glue the tongue into position on the first board and blind nail it with your machine. Rack out the other side of the floor and complete the installation. Pre-finished floating floors are versatile and easy to install. They can be installed almost anywhere, including over concrete, wood, particle board, or existing tile. As with other installations, inspect the subfloor to make sure it's structurally sound and flat to within one eighth inch in six feet. When the floor is flat, roll out the one eighth inch foam sheets to cover the subfloor. In this demonstration, we're going to be installing a pre-finished floating floor, which is an engineered floor. It's made up of multiple layers of plywood with a hardwood on top. It's generally an eighth inch thick. Uh, this is a floating floor, so we will not fasten it to the subfloor in any way at all. We will fill the groove full of glue, put it down, knock it together. Remember to always wipe up the excess glue and be careful because it is a pre-finished product. Decide in advance how you will work and where you will store your tools and materials. Keep cardboard under tools and materials at all times to avoid scraping the floor or spilling the glue. Starting in the corner of the room, lay the first row of planks in place. Then set half-inch expansion shims around the edges to maintain the expansion space. Using the manufacturer's recommended glue, Attach the planks together by applying glue to the top inside edge of the groove. Gluing procedures may vary, so always follow the manufacturer's recommended procedures. Do not attempt to fasten the planks to the subfloor. Join the planks together. Then, using the recommended tapping block against the tongue, make sure the planks are tightly secured. Wipe up the excess glue with the recommended cleaner. At the end of the row, use a pry bar to wedge the last board into place and secure the row. As with any tongue and groove flooring product, you want to flip your product to mark it when you're at the wall. So to keep all your seams staggered, you want to be sure that whatever's left over from your cut, you can use at your starter wall to keep all the seams staggered. So we push the board against the wall tight, your tongue sticking out. You mark it right dead even with your other seam, you go cut it, you have your quarter inch gap. For the last row, measure the gap, leaving a half inch expansion space. And cut the planks as needed. Use your pry bar to wedge the planks in place. And shim the last row to hold it fast. As a professional installer, you'll be called upon to install many types of wood floors in different applications. When you know and follow the guidelines for a high quality installation and take the time to do the job right, you reap the benefits. A great looking floor, the satisfaction of knowing your work will stand the test of time, and satisfied customers who are glad to recommend you to their neighbors and friends.